And death shall have no dominion. Dead men naked, they shall be one with the man in the wind and the west moon. When their bones are picked clean and the clean bones gone, they shall have stars at elbow and foot. Though they go mad, they shall be sane. Though they sink through the sea, they shall rise again. Though lovers be lost, love shall not, and death shall have no dominion. Exactly 50 years ago, despite his meager knowledge of English, my father was so captivated by Dylan Thomas reading his own poems on the BBC that he left his village in the cold Norwegian wilderness and paid his way by peeling potatoes on the boat to London, where he by some kind of magic became a member of the press club and without a penny managed to come to Swansea. To see this fairy tale town of Dillons with his own eyes. Now, 50 years later, my brother Marcus and I brought my two sons, Raphael, who is nine, and Sam, who is 15, to see the same sights as the grandpa who died long before they were even thought of. As our father we went by boat and when we reached Harwich we could look over to the lovely home by the sea of our hosts painter Carol Lawrence and the poet Ian Griffiths. But to actually meet the couple we had to catch a train all the way to the west coast of Britain to the hometown of both Dylan Thomas and Ian. I first came across Dylan's uh, poetry as a, as a child when we bought uh, a couple of the old LP records uh, of quite early one morning in the radio broadcasts and then, uh, and then a recording made with Dylan in, um, in New York of Under Milk Wood and I just used to play that record over and over <laughs> again and the, the music went into my soul yeah. and uh, so i have been reciting it when I got up in the morning, any time <laughs> at all the words came to me. I was born in a large Welsh town at the beginning of the Great War. An ugly, lovely town, or so it was and is to me, crawling, sprawling by a long and splendid curving shore where truant boys and sandfield boys and old men from nowhere Beachcombed, idled and paddled, watched the dock-bound ships or the ships steaming away into wonder and India, magic and China, countries bright with oranges and loud with lions. One man, I remember, used to take off his hat and set fire to his hair every now and then, but I do not remember what it proved, if it proved anything at all, except that he was a very interesting man. This sea town was my world. Outside a strange Wales, coal-pitted, mountained river run, full, so far as I knew, of choirs and football teams and sheep and storybook tall black hats and red flannel petticoats moved about its business, which was none of mine. At the beginning, the only front I knew was the little lobby before our front door. I could not understand how so many people never returned from there. But later I grew to know more, though still without understanding, and carried a wooden rifle in the park and shot down the invisible unknown enemy like a flock of wild birds. But this house, how long did Dylan live here? For, um, he was born in 1914, he left here in 1937, so he was 23. But the last three years that they were here, he was back and forth London, you know? But he always had to come back to recharge, really. Couldn't you show us a little bit round? Yeah, I can, if yeah. you want. <laughs> uh, this is the bedroom that Dylan was born in. Um, he was only born in this room because somebody from outside was coming in to deliver him. His parents lived and um, slept in the back because it was warmer. No fires were here, upstairs or down in the front. So she had her baby here and then would have moved 
swiftly back to the warmth in the back bedroom. This room is mum and dad's room. Um, this is the warmest bedroom in the house. So uh, Florian and DJ would have slept here. And when they, they had the house, these um, buildings that you can see to the back weren't there. They weren't built until the late 1920s. So the view from this window would have been rural, going into the town and the valley, Swansea Valley beyond, and the docks. So it was completely open. Here you see, on the right hand side you see Mumbles Point, the lighthouse, and over the other side you see something called Nash Point, which is the whole of Swansea Bay. The Mumbles. Pretty curious name that. Um, and it comes from when sailing ships used to come up the Bristol Channel. And once the sailors had seen the Mumbles Point there, they knew that the main docks uh, was just around the corner in Swansea. Um, but the two rocks on, of, of the, that series reminded the sailors of a part of a woman's body they hadn't seen for quite a while. And they're called Les Meumles, which means the mammaries. Um, and so from Les Meumles comes Mumbles. <laughs> but Dylan writes um, that as a child he would watch ships sailing across rooftops. And if you go down to a child's height, and you can imagine the ships, that the bay would have been full of ships. They would have looked as if they were sailing across that rooftop. Quite near where I lived, so near that on summer evenings I could listen in my bed to the voices of the older children playing ball on the sloping paper littered bank. The park was full of terror and treasures. Though it was only a little park, it held within its borders of old trees notched with our names and shabby from our climbing, as many secret places, caverns and forests, prairies and deserts, as a country somewhere at the end of the sea. And though we would explore it one day, armed and desperate, from end to end, from the robber's den to the pirate's cabin, the highwayman's inn to the cattle ranch, or the hidden room in the undergrowth where we held beetle races and lit wood fires and roasted potatoes and talked about Africa and the makes of motor cars. Yet still the next day it remained as unexplored as the poles, a country just born and always changing. This is the fountain basin where I sailed my ship. There used to be a chain, a cup with a chair on the chain here and uh, as Dylan says, they f kids would fill it with gravel. But uh, I, I love the whole um, idea of that. It sort of sums up everything really, doesn't it? The fountain basin where I sailed by ship, it, life itself is there. The hunchback in the park, a solitary mister, propped between trees and water from the opening of the garden lock that lets the trees and water enter until the Sunday sombre bell at dark. Eating bread from a newspaper, drinking water from the chained cup that the children filled with gravel in the fountain basin where I sailed my ship. Slept at night in a dog kennel, but nobody chained him up. Like the park birds, he came early. Like the water, he sat down. And Mister, they called, hey, Mister, the truant boys from the town, running when he had heard them clearly, on out of sound, past lake and rockery, laughing when he shook his paper, hunchbacked in mockery through the loud zoo of the willow groves, dodging the park keeper with his stick that picked up leaves. And the old dog sleeper, alone between nurses and swans, while the boys amongst willows made the tigers jump out of their eyes to roar on the rockery stones, 
all night in the unmade park. After the railings and shrubberies, the birds, the grass, the trees, the lake, and the wild boys, innocent as strawberries, had followed the hunchback to his kennel in the dark. Do you know anything about Dylan Thomas? No, he lived on the road there. Yes. But you come here often? Just for a drink. Just for a drink? <laughs> That's not too bad. So here we are at the wonderful location of Rasili where we can read the story of extraordinary little cough. One afternoon in a particularly bright and glowing August, some years before I knew I was happy, George Hooping, whom we called Little Cough, Sidney Evans, Dan Davis and I sat on the roof of a lorry travelling to the end of the peninsula. It was a tall six-wheeled lorry from which we could spit on the roofs of passing cars and throw our apple stumps at women on the pavement. Four boys on a roof, one tall, dark, regular-featured, precise of speech in a good suit, a boy of the world, one squat, ungainly, red-haired, his red wrists fighting out of short frayed sleeves. One heavily spectacled, small paunched with a little with indoor shoulders and feet in always unlaced boots wanting to go different ways. One small, thin, indecisive, active, quick to death, get dirty, curly, sore, their field in front of them. A fortnight's new home that had thick pricking hedges for walls, the sea for a front garden, a green gutter for a lavatory, and a wind-struck tree in the very middle. Let's build our tents by the tree in the middle, said George. We pitched our tents in a corner out of the wind. One of us must like the primus, Sidney said. And after George had burned his hand, we sat in a circle outside the sleeping tent, talking about motor cars, content to be in the country, lazily easy in each other's company, thinking to ourselves as we talked, knowing always that the sea dashed on the rocks not far below us and rolled out into the world, and that tomorrow we would bathe and throw a ball on the sands and stone a bottle on a rock and perhaps meet three girls. We sat by the fire in the corner of the field, the sea far out was still making a noise. And when I stared round at George again, he was lying on his back, fast asleep in the deep grass, and his hair was touching the flames. Welcome to the Dylan Thomas Center. That's Dylan Thomas in a bookstore in New York in the early 50s, signing one of the LPs of his work. And just came out. Did you see the memorial stone in Cumdonkin Park? Yes. That was paid for by the two American ladies who set up the recording company to record Dylan Thomas' poetry. It was two students and they produced all those Kaidman recordings of Dylan Thomas that yeah. are now available as a box set. And there's a great quote by Paul McCartney here. Oh. I'm sure that the main influence on both Bob Dylan and John was Dylan Thomas. That's why Bob's not Bob, Bob Zimmerman, his real name. We all used to like Dylan Thomas. I read him a lot. I think that John started writing because of him. And we've got the Sergeant Pepper album cover here. And you can see Dylan Thomas just behind the stats in there. What can you say about Caitlin? Since you're standing right in front of her. <laughs> I think it's probably one of the great relationships in literature, isn't it? It's very, very famous, very tempestuous. She loved him. Yeah, and they, they, they loved each other. Otherwise, they probably would have put up with each other. <laughs> but they almost killed each other also. Yeah. yeah. So how, how did they meet? They met in the Wheat Sheep pub in London. And she was having a relationship with the artist Augustus John, who is the artist of this painting and Dylan was in London at the time and they met in the pub and 
he apparently put his head in her lap and told her he was going to marry her. <laughs> but something must have worked because they then went to the Eiffel Tower Hotel and stayed there for the next couple of days and when they left they charged the bill to Augustus John. He doesn't look very happy. He doesn't look very well at all, though, does he? So what was his illness? He had all sorts of complaints. Um, he, was, he was struggling with gout. He had various problems with his stomach as well, I think. He'd lost his appetite. He and was he working very hard. Diabetes, didn't he? Apparently, yeah. Yeah, there's one theory that he was an undiagnosed diabetic, which obviously would have had a very massive implications. Mm. Terrible. And then there was a medical malpractice as well. So he was injected with three times the amount of morphine that someone should, anyone should be injected with. So that so, seems to have partly led to the coma. So like Michael Jackson in a way. <laughs> yeah, Michael Jackson, Dylan Thomas. All these rock and roll stars. These are the original doors to his writing shed in Larne. So here we are. We're entering the village of Larn. We've seen the original doors for this are now in the Dylan Thomas Centre. This is where he came to write his retreat. Here we are, very privileged, special place to be. Dylan's writing room. A little cabin perched on the track above the house overlooking the Heron Priesthood shore. Picture of dear, a photograph of D.H. Lawrence above the desk. A portrait of Dylan by Alfred Jaynes. A couple of Picasso pictures. The inevitable empty bottle. The mug of cocoa. The discarded drafts on the floor. A small fire. Keep him warm in winter. That's Kevin Milkwood. The opening piece of Undermilk Wood is unlike almost any other opening to a play. A wonderful introduction. To begin at the beginning. It is spring, moonless night in the small town. Starless and Bible black. The cobble streets silent and the hunched quarters and rabbit's wood limping invisible down to the slow, black, crow-black fishing boat bobbing sea. The houses are blind as moles, though moles see fine tonight in the snouting velvet dingles, or blind as Captain Cat, there in the muffled middle by the pump and the town hall clock, the welfare hall in widow's weeds, and all the people of the lulled and dumbfound town are sleeping now. Hush, the babies are sleeping, the farmers, the fishers, the tradesmen and pensioners, cobbler, school teacher, postman and publican, the undertaker and the fancy woman, drunkard, dressmaker, preacher, policeman, the webfoot cockle women and the tidy wives. Young girls lie bedded soft, or glide in their dreams with rings and trousseau, brides mated by glowworms down the aisles of the organ-playing wood. The boys are dreaming wicked, or of the bucking ranches of the night and the Jolly Roger Sea, and the anthracite statues of the horses sleeping in the fields, and the cows in the byres, and the dogs in the wet-nosed yards and the cats nap in the slant corners, or lope sly, streaking and needling on the one cloud of the roofs. You can hear the dew falling, and the hushed town breathing. Only your eyes are unclosed to see the black and folded town fast and slow asleep, 
and you alone can hear the invisible starfall, the darkest before dawn, minutely dew-grey stir of the black dab-filled sea, where the Arethusa, the Curlew, the Skylark, Zanzibar, Rhiannon, and the Rover, the Cormorant, and the Star of Wales tilt and ride. Listen, it is night moving in the streets, the processional salt slow, musical wind in Coronation Street and Cocker Row. It is the grass growing on Laregab Hill, dewfall, starfall, the sleep of birds in milk wood. Listen, it is night in the chill squat chapel, hymning in bonnet and brooch and bombazine black, butterfly choker and bootlace bow, coughing like nanny goat, sucking mintos, forty winking, hallelujah. Night in the four ale, quiet as a domino. In Oki Milkman's loft, like a mouse with gloves. In Dye Bread's bakery, flying like black flour. It is tonight in Donkey Street, trotting silent with seaweed on its hooves along the cockled cobbles, post past curtain, fern pot, text and trinket, harmonium, holy dresser, watercolours done by hand, china dog and rosy tin tea caddy. It is night, look. It is night, dumbly, royally, winding through the coronation cherry trees, going through the graveyard of Bethesda with winds gloved and folded and dew doth, tumbling by the sailor's arms. Time passes. Listen, time passes. Come closer now. Only you can hear the houses sleeping in the streets in the slow, deep, salt and silent black bandage night. Only you can see in the blinded bedrooms the combs and petticoats over the chairs, the jugs and bases, the glasses of teeth thou shalt not on the wall, and the yellowing dicky bird watching pictures of the dead. Only you can hear and see behind the eyes of the sleepers countries and mazes and colours and dismays and rainbows and tunes and wishes and flight and fall and despairs and big seas of their dreams. Dylan wrote uh, his story, Return Journey, and of course this for me is very much my return journey as well, both to uh, my own roots and revisiting Dylan's roots. And uh, so he here we are standing now outside the Garth uh, at Southgate in Gower. Uh, this is somewhere where we know for sure that uh, Dylan would have come uh, to visit his friend uh, Vernon Watkins and his wife Gwen. Uh, Dylan and Vernon uh, were uh, corresponded enormously about uh, their poetry. Uh, Dylan took a lot of advice from Vernon. I, I can't say that I ever had any conversations with Vernon himself, but he used to come and go uh, when I used to visit uh, Gwen Watkins for uh, my English tuition after I left school. And um, my memory mostly of Vernon was uh, his very poetic appearance and coming in one day uh, and uh, having a guillemot that he'd found somewhere on his walks here on, on these beaches below these uh, cliffs. And it had got, as often happened in those days, covered in oil and he had rescued it and brought it in. Quite what happened to it after that I don't remember. Um, but that was my main memory of Vernon himself, apart from seeing him about walking on, on the cliffs and around about uh, Southgate. Um, but one of the particular stories about him, of course, uh, as he was working as a banker at that time, uh, a bank manager at that time, I should say, uh, was that he managed to come home one day, having left the bank unlocked. Um, I think he managed to survive in his post after that, but it certainly earned him some notoriety. Of course, there was the story that uh, um, Dylan let Vernon down enormously at his uh, wedding when Dylan was meant to be the best man and uh, never managed to turn up for whatever reason. Uh, but their friendship persisted beyond that, although it uh, must have been a very hard thing for Vernon to uh, forgive. So. Have a look now at the location of the garden. Um, I would sit in the shed at the back somewhere and study Ben Jonson or, or Shakespeare. 
um, but this was um, uh, an often visited but in, in, uh, in one's youth one doesn't know quite how important and uh, relevant the places you are so it was just part of the scenery of my childhood here at uh, Southgate. Warren Watkins died a long time ago but their son gave us the new address of Gwen naturally at Mumbles. I think from that the moment he met him, Vernon almost worshipped him. Not him as a person, although he was a delightful person, but his genius. This is Jan Christian from Oslo, Norway, and his brother Marcus. Ah. Sebastian, who is a young rapper, mm -hmm. and uh, Raphael. Nice to see you. They were both oh, these very, very painstaking creation, and what they did was with each other's poems. They would rip them to bits yes. and then put them together again yes. with enormous amount of arguing and dissension and, you know, because Dylan said, well, writing poetry is plumbing, really. You need to get, you know, the, the bits connection. absolutely fitting together yes. with no break. Yes. And, and, uh, Vernon said, well, it's like getting a telephone message from the muse, but it's a very bad line. When Dylan moved to London and away, he still sent Vernon, all through the war he sent Vernon a lot of his poems, but it was the American connection. Once he had this kind of American uh, tremendous adoration and, you know, mm. flim flam and ev mm. everything, mm. I think that was a thing that didn't suit Dylan, really. The money suited him, the admiration suited him. The fact that huge crowds came to hear <laughs> reading, you know, I mean, what poet yes. wouldn't like yes. that? Yes. yes, Vernon found it in America, you know. The, the students the, the, yes. coming and yes. saying, you know, Mr. Watkins, I'd do anything to get an A. <laughs> <laughs> work, Vernon said. <laughs> How wonderfully you know, Vernon but, to say that. Dylan, yes. <laughs> he did tremendously respond to this because although he was regarded in London certainly as a tremendous entertainer, and he was, mm, yes. he was the most brilliant person to be with. That's terribly tiring, you know. Yes. You give Singing for your supper. Yes. And except when he had the film job. He had to kowtow to editors, to the BBC, yes, yes. to to get enough money to support his children. And Kathleen was no help because <laughs> money, she was Irish, money to her meant something to spend as yes, soon as you got yes, it. You yes, know. yes. But on the other hand, I have to say that if he'd been married to somebody like me who was very careful about things, he wouldn't have stayed with me for a month. <laughs> Kathleen was... Um, yes you know, aristocratic, brilliant, yes. exciting yes. to him. Awful, yes, awful, terrible to live with. But she had, I, I, people say their marriage was breaking up. I don't think he'd ever have left her, you know. No. I don't think she'd have let him, for one thing. No. She went after him and toward him. <laughs> Kathleen said to me, all Dylan wants, really, is the little suburban house, semi-detached, where I'd put his slippers to warm in front of the fire every evening. Um, you know. Yes. And there was a truth about that. Mm. He came from this household where his father, who was a grammar school teacher, was madly worried about money. Yes who had rows about the bills with yes. his mother. Who, yes. He was brought up with this atmosphere mm. yes. of money is very, very important. Mm. You must pay your bills. Yes. And when he couldn't, he was very worried. Yes. And, and this burden was on him too. Kathleen couldn't care less. She really couldn't. Mm. Yes. Aristocratic Irish, she would have run up bills until, yes. you know, the house was sold over <laughs> her head. Yes. But not Dylan. Yes. He was in many ways quite conventional yes. Welsh. People don't think this. Mm -hmm. And they talk about him as a womanizer. But, you know, he really wasn't. Women, oh yes, they loved him because yes. he was so yes. cuddly and yes. he had these head of curls, yes. you know. Yes. They loved him and they yes. came on to him tremendously. Yes. But until he met this woman, Pearl, in America, I don't think he'd ever... I used to think that he didn't really sleep with these women yeah. who boasted of it. Yes, 
What he liked was to cuddle them yes. and feel their yes. breasts. Yes. And also he was very afraid of sleeping alone at night, you know. When he stayed with us, really? he said, can I sleep in, on your floor? Yes. And Did I he said, visit well, you no, there at Dylan, the... not really. <laughs> well, will you leave your door open? <laughs> I'll leave my door open. Is that true? No, yeah. he really was yeah. frightened of, the, of yeah. sleeping alone. And I think often if some woman came on to him, he would stay, he'd say, can I stay with you? Yes. And sleep with her and cuddle yes. her and yes. nuzzle into her yes. bosom and everything. Yes. But I don't I think many of that. them. <laughs> no. I don't think he no. uh, made love to many of them. No. Kathleen said angrily to me once that he wasn't very good at that. Yes, mm. yes. Whether, the, whether she was just angry or not, I don't know. But anyway, yes. you know, the post-mortem showed that his liver was yes. swollen but not cirrhosed. Yes. He was not an alcoholic. He really mm. was not. How could he have given those wonderful readings? Yes. How could he have written the end of Alder Milk Wood in yes. two hours? You, know? yes. you can't do that if you're an alcoholic. No. I think they like to get him drunk in America because this was a... Yes. This was a performance, you know. Yes. Look at this drunk staggering on and then yes. suddenly coming up and making this wonderful delivery yes. of poems. Because yes. I don't think Americans had ever heard poems read. No. The way that Dylan read no. them. No. I don't think they had. I found in the latest biography of Dylan, Vernon saying this in the obituary. He said, No one has ever worn more brilliantly the mask of anarchy to conceal the true face of tradition. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm. Mm. That's the Heim mm. Dylan, you see, yeah. was the the poet, mm. the person who praised the beauty of creation, mm. who praised even even sorrow. Even I think he knew he was going to die. You know, if you read those last great poems, mm. over Sir John's Hill, mm. the souls of the slain birds singing. Mm. I think he always knew that he wasn't going to be a long liver. Or at any rate, I think the muse knew. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learned too late they grieved it on its way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death, who see with blinding sight, blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay, rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on the sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Do not go gentle into that good night Old age should burn and rave at close of day Rage, rage against the dying The wise man at their end no dark is right Because their words had fought no lightning They do not go gentle into that good night Good men, the last wave by crying how bright Their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay Rage Rage against The dying of the light Wild men who caught And sang the sun In light Flat 
And learn too late they grieve it on its way Do not go gentle Into that Good Grave men near death who see with blinding sight Blind eyes could blaze like meteors And be gay Rage, rage against the dying of the light And you, my father, there on the sad height Curse Bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Do not go gentle. That good night Rage, rage Against the dying Of the life Do not go gentle Into that good night See with blinding sight Blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay Rage, rage against the dying of the light And you, my father, there on the sad height Curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray Do not go gentle into that good night Rage, rage against the dying of the light.